Hey everybody, Thrasher here. This is it. This is our culminating video on kinematics, describing the motion of objects as we finally, or at least officially, because we have been hinting at it for a little while, combine horizontal and vertical motion into projectile motion. Learning the basic idea of what's happening and of course using the physics equations that we've gone over to calculate values for projectiles. Here we go. All right. Now, the basic idea of projectile motion is actually pretty easy. If I took, say, just a cannonball and I dropped it off a cliff, I know that here on Earth things fall downwards, or negative, depending on how you define it. Things fall downwards and accelerate downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. So if I just dropped a cannonball, it would fall and accelerate downwards. If instead I fired a cannon, if I could, in like deep outer space, away from any net forces of gravity, it wouldn't fall downwards, right? If I could fire a cannon in deep space, it would only move horizontally. And once it leaves that cannon, there's nothing any longer like pushing or pulling on the cannonball. So actually this cannon in deep space would travel outwards at some constant horizontal velocity. Again, once it leaves the cannon, if it's not impacting with something, again, you know, no air resistance in deep space, it's going to move at a constant rate. Well, if we now took the cannon, placed it on top of this cliff here on Earth, ignore air resistance, we have both of these two things happening. I'm going to fire the cannon. If we ignore air resistance, there's nothing pushing or pulling on that cannonball as it moves, but it's going to be pulled down due to gravity. That's what creates this classic projectile path. So what is projectile motion? Well, it's really just something that's in free fall while it's moving horizontally. That's it. It's that simple. The execution tends to be a little more difficult. The mathematics can be a little complicated, but the basic idea is relatively straightforward. If you're not convinced, let's maybe go over it in a little more detail. Okay, here's another scenario very similar. I'm throwing a baseball or you're throwing a baseball just through the air. Okay, what are some things that we've learned or some things that we've assumed about this kind of motion? Well, while it's flying through the air, we're ignoring air resistance. Even if we weren't, you know, in real life, while there is some air resistance, it's pretty small on a baseball, okay? There's not a huge noticeable effect on it. If you had something like a parachute or something, it'd be much more noticeable, but we're gonna ignore it nonetheless. Because we're ignoring air resistance, we're assuming the ball isn't hitting a table or a wall or anything. There is gravity and only gravity that's causing the motion of the object to change. The only thing that's causing an acceleration of G. Well, when we ignore air resistance and there's a constant downward acceleration of G, that's what we call free fall. And again, like the cannon, once it leaves your hand, the moment the ball leaves your hand, you're no longer pushing it, right? You're no longer tossing it. You're no longer touching it. So if there's no air resistance, it's not hitting a wall, the horizontal velocity should not be accelerating. It should not be changing. So it's constant. Remember, we saw in the last video, I think, kind of a cheap way or uh, kind of a cheat cheat kind of way to look at constant horizontal motion. It's just that equation. It's pretty easy. So when we have projectiles, we can combine both of these ideas, free fall and the equations we learn for free fall, and the simple idea that the horizontal motion is staying the same. Now, here's a diagram that's representing a little more in detail with the vectors of what's happening. So let's say I throw the ball and I only throw it horizontally. So I'm not throwing it upwards or downwards in this example. The moment it leaves my hand, of course it's moving horizontally. Now, the very moment it leaves my hand, if I'm truly throwing it just in the horizontal direction, it's not moving up or down to start. So the initial vertical would be zero, right? It's just going this way. It has some horizontal motion. And again, when it leaves my hand, that horizontal motion isn't changing. But we're on Earth, right? So the moment it leaves my hand, okay, while it starts with zero vertical velocity, it starts accelerating downward. And acceleration means that the velocity is increasing, in this case, increasing in the downward direction. So over time, that velocity downward gets more and more and more and more negative. You have something like this. 
the horizontal velocity is staying the same, but the vertical velocity is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on because of that downward acceleration g. So what's the overall path? Forgive my drawing abilities. Well, it would be this overall path like this. This is the velocity of the object. It starts almost perfectly horizontal because there's almost no vertical velocity, but then as it travels, it starts arcing steeper and steeper downwards because now it has a very large vertical velocity. That's it, that's what projectile motion is. Here's a better diagram, an official or a professionally created diagram. But the basic idea, right at the beginning, it has no vertical motion, but because we're here on Earth, it accelerates, it gains motion in the vertical direction and it increases. But notice, it doesn't matter that it was moving, if I was just releasing it, I'd still have that same amount of vertical motion. It's not changing because it's moving horizontally, because remember, horizontal motion doesn't affect vertical motion. We learned that in the last video. And because there's no air resistance, there's nothing affecting, there's nothing pushing or pulling on the object horizontally, this horizontal velocity is staying the same throughout. And again, you get this overall velocity. That's what this solid green is, okay, marking the overall velocity as it's arcing downward. So let's look at our equations that, frankly, we've already learned. This is review. Okay, maybe I have a nice different color table, but we've already done this. In the horizontal motion, there's no acceleration. So the horizontal velocity is constant. These two equations are, they're the same equation. I've just rewritten them, okay? That horizontal velocity is super easy, just the displacement horizontally divided by time. You might be asked a lot of times to find out like the horizontal distance or displacement it travels. So it might be convenient to write it like this a little more often, but it's that basic easy equation. Now vertically, it's accelerating. It's accelerating at 9.8 downward. So if I say that upwards is positive, I'll plug in a negative into that equation. And here were those constant acceleration equations, ones that we actually learned you know, a couple of weeks ago, probably, if you're in my class. All right. Now, for this middle one, classically, it's written like this, y equals y naught plus v y naught t, et cetera, et cetera. But if I subtracted y naught from both sides, because I can do that, I would have y minus y naught, which is the same thing as delta y. Okay, so sometimes that's a little bit of a cheat. You might already be doing that. You might see Mr. Thrasher already doing that if you're in my class. But these equations are the same thing. Okay, but sometimes it's often written like this as just delta y. All right, and then you still have these same terms on the right side of the equation. And then same equation that we learned about before. Okay, v squared equals v naught squared plus 2gy. We've already done that. Now, there is something that you need to realize here. All right, we use these two equations when we're looking at the horizontal and vertical components. But that is not the like true velocity. All these vx's and these vy's that you see here and here and here and here and here's that vx, they're all these dashed lines. All of these are the dashed lines. But let's say it asks, like, what is the actual velocity at this spot? That's the solid green line. The solid green line is the actual velocity the ball has. We're breaking it into components so we can use these equations. How could I figure out this kind of true velocity, the actual vector that the ball is traveling, if I know vx and I know vy? If I know this side of the triangle VX and I know this side of the triangle VY, how could I find the true velocity V? Oh my goodness, if you're thinking the Pythagorean theorem, absolutely. So this is gonna be used in our arsenal. So we need to be careful. It's, if it's asking for just like the velocity, that's not VX, that's not VY. You might have to use the Pythagorean theorem to find that out. If I want the true velocity right here, well, if I know VX and if I can figure out VY, then I could use the Pythagorean theorem to pretty easily calculate that. So just know, we break things into components so we can use our two equations, but you might need to use the Pythagorean theorem to kind of go back to the actual vector, how the ball's really moving, not the two pieces of that vector, okay?
Here's just another diagram. I don't have to spend too much time, but it's the same idea. If I was, say, kicking a football from ground level, it's a little different because we're starting off going upwards, but again, the horizontal velocity is staying the same, and even though it's being moving even though it's moving upwards to start, it's still accelerating downward, right? We still have that G acting down. So the velocity first gets smaller and smaller, then it gets bigger and bigger in the downward direction. The VX, though, is always staying the same, okay? So we can still use our components. We can still use those constant acceleration equations. We're not gonna do any actual math in this video. It would make this video way too long. The next video is just a couple of examples, okay? so. Here are some last minute kind of ideas or tips to keep in mind when you start doing some of these problems. Many math problems for projectile motion, they'll ask you to calculate like the impact speed. They might say this on a problem, calculate the impact speed or impact velocity. They'll often use these interchangeably. Or maybe you'll see a question like, what is the speed when the ball hits the ground? Or what is the velocity of the cannonball's impact? We need to be very careful about what this means and what it doesn't mean. These are always referring to the speed or the velocity just before impact. That's what they mean, okay? They're asking about this velocity right here, the instant before it hits the ground. How fast is it going? You know, right before it strikes the ground, what is this velocity? What I mean by that is your answer should never be zero, okay? Yeah, you're right that in real life the ball eventually hits the ground and stops moving, but that is no longer projectile motion. Remember, projectile motion is only when it's in free fall, when it's accelerating at G. So you're never going to write down for any of these kind of questions like, oh, the speed or the velocity is zero because it's hit the ground at impact. You should never be plugging in like the final velocity for VY as zero. That is not true. For these scenarios, we're looking at the object while it's moving through the air, okay? So you're looking at kind of that instant right before it hits the ground. The last thing, oh, this is my final slide. For some tougher problems, and we'll come across them just a handful of times, it might ask you to calculate the angle of impact. Now, I'm not gonna go over SOHCAHTOA and how to calculate angles here, but I see a common mistake from students. So let's say I like, throw this ball off this cliff, and I'm asking for what is this angle of impact that the ball has right before it strikes? So maybe like it's this angle right here, okay? Often it's with the horizontal direction, but let's say I was trying to calculate this angle, this angle with respect to the horizontal. The angle as the ball is moving is changing. Notice this angle is smaller than this angle. It got a little bigger, gets a little bigger, gets a little bigger. Remember that horizontal velocity kind of starts taking over. But let's be very clear. The angle is changing because of the velocity vectors. So if it's ever asking for the impact angle or the angle of the motion, you should be using the angle of the velocity vectors, these things right here. What I see some students try and do is they look at the displacement. Like they figure out that it traveled 30 uh, centimeters to the right, it fell, I don't know, 60 centimeters downward, and then they do some Pythagorean theorem and they calculate this angle right here. That is not the angle the ball is actually traveling at impact, okay? Because how it's moving through the air is based on the velocity. So don't actually do this. You're using the velocity vectors, not the displacement vectors. I see that mistake quite a bit. Okay, so these can be tough, but hopefully you recognize from this video that the basis, what we're doing, it's really the same that we've been doing before, vertical motion and horizontal motion. Now we're just combining them. So it takes a little bit of time from a math perspective, but we're not adding anything new. There's not really any new physics going on here. Okay, oh, good luck. Come back to this video as you need it. Thanks for watching.